Welcome to the Jefferson County Post interview with Director of Schools Tommy Arnold and uh, Director of Data and County Ability Supervisor uh, Trevor Collins. He's the go-to guy for numbers and what we're talking about today is the uh, recent third grade TCAP numbers that have come out across the state including Jefferson County and the fallout from this information and what it means to our students. Thank you guys for coming and talking to us. Um, there's been a lot of confusion about the information that's come out. And if you guys could just start in on, uh, maybe uh, Director Arnold, if you could start with leading us into how this came about. Uh, whether this was a district thing or is this a state thing, uh, a little background. Sure, this is definitely a state initiative that came out in the fall of 2022. Um, our school board was very adamant that they did not like the state stepping in and issuing retention um, regulation of our students. And our school board passed a resolution. We sent it to the state legislation um, stating um, adamantly that we were against how far this reached into our district. So from that, um, there was some modifications, some addendums to the legislation that ended up getting passed that we are facing now. But um, it is 100% a, a state initiative that has been passed down through Tennessee Code Annotated and we are mandated to follow through and, and adhere to that policy. Uh, along those lines, just so folks know the numbers that are, are for Jefferson County in the state. Uh, right now, Jefferson County in third grade, these are only third grade readers, and it's only in reading that we're talking about. Um, in third grade, we have 38.5%, uh, excuse me, 38.57% of our students, is, I assume that's correct, Trevor, that are um, <coughs> proficient, that either meet the benchmark or they're above the benchmark. And that is that number is just one point, a, a little more than one point, one point four something, from the state numbers. So Jefferson County is right there with the with the state. I, I mean, it's not like we're lagging behind. Is that correct, Griffin? Correct. Um, and also, I would say we we saw an increase year over year. Um, we grew roughly five and four tenths percent, while the state saw an increase of four point three percent. So, you know, our, our growth is more than that of the state as we continue to narrow that gap and hopefully pull ahead in the coming years. So, Jefferson County, and when we talk about um, uh, less than 40% of our students are hitting those benchmarks, that's on the TCAP assessment, which is taken in the spring of, of the years, correct? correct? So, do you all have other testing? Are there other benchmarks that you're using for these students that... that either uh, are the same as these numbers or, or maybe different than these numbers? So I would, um, yes, in, in just school in general, we realize that the TCAP is meant to do one thing for us. It's meant to provide a common stake in the ground for districts across the entire state of Tennessee. So every year when we use that data, it is to see how we have moved compared to other districts. But our internal platform to test is for grades K-8 is iReady. And that assessment is given three times a year, which means that when the data comes in, we are able to actually use those numbers to target improvements, to study teachers, student trajectories, and, and, and those types of factors to actually change instruction. Once TCAP comes back, you're pretty much left with what you have. You then have to plan for the next year. So our eternal numbers um, currently are, are taken, again, at the same time period, shortly after the TCAP test is given. We have right now in Jefferson County, according to the national screener, again, iReady, 66% of our students in the county are scoring on grade level for third grade reading. That is different from the 38.6% that you'll see on the TCAP assessment as being labeled proficient. That's a huge difference. That's a very large increase. So. Are we putting that down, Director Ron? Did you put that down to um, the fact that the TCAP is a one is, is a one horse pony? It's a one time thing, and this other test is three times a year. So you have the opportunity to, uh, if you don't do well the first time, you've got a couple of other days. You know, if you're sick, you don't feel good, you have a headache, something went on. Um, what is the difference? Do you think in those two tests? 
I think the iReady assessment is measuring students reading on grade level based on the Tennessee standards. So based on our standards, students are able to that perform to proficiency level on the iReady are reading on or above grade level, those 66% of those students. So in, in your in your estimation, and I'm asking this to both of you, would you, do you put more value in the iReady test than you do the TCAP test as far as results? I think both the TCAP assessment and the iReady assessment have value, but in our Give, in, in Jefferson County Schools, given the iReady assessment three times, it is what drives instruction. The TCAP assessment is only a snapshot of what that student performed based on the state um, criteria of how they determine reading ability of students. And there's various variables that go into that TCAP assessment. Um, but the iReady assessment is only um, it, the iReady assessment is only showing students um, ability to read on grade level. I know that there's some really interesting information that you have about that iReady. Um, that uh, you know, uh, I've seen a graph that you have that that shows that Jefferson County students are making improvements throughout the year. It, it, there is a, a marked improvement. <coughs> Uh, could you discuss that a little bit? So to, to add to what Dr. Arnold said, um, I think you have to realize the intention of the TCAP is different than that of iReady. Um, the iReady assessment is comparing every student across the country. It's not just Tennessee students. So it's giving you a, a larger snapshot of overall student performance. Um, it lets us measure from the beginning of the year to the end of the year, from the beginning of the year to the middle of the year. And it, it really provides that holistic view to where TCAP again is like if, if you lock down the world to give TCAP, you know, you change a student's schedule, you change a student's month. iReady is something that we do that's more laid back. Again, there are lots of rules in place for how it's administered, but it is a more child friendly approach. So when we look at these current third graders, they are the students who March of their kindergarten year, when they were beginning to put together the pieces of reading, they were sent home. We saw schools closed. We saw schools closed for the remainder of that semester. And these are students who everybody has worried about over the last three years because they missed the end of their kindergarten year. They move into first grade and they are distance learning. There are teacher absences. There are large numbers of students' absences. And at the end of the first grade year, using iReady, because we don't do TCAP for first graders, 48% of students left first grade at the end of the year on grade level, according to iReady. Um, we moved into that second grade year, and as well, that was the first year these kids experienced normal or normal-ish school. Um, at the end of that year, they were 50%. And as a district staff, with our director, as we begin to look at those numbers, we realized that we had to go ahead and provide those students with extra supports as they moved into third grade. This wasn't a, oh, we don't want them retained. This was a, they need additional supports to make up the gaps. They were flagging as a concern for our district. So we poured additional resources and time, support, and training into those students. And when they left third grade, those students who were at 48% in first grade left third grade at 66% on grade level. That is two-thirds of our students are able to read according to a nationally normed assessment on their grade level. That's a big deal in three years' time. That's a, that's a lot of growth in three years' time. Absolutely. And I'm sure I know that the staff has worked really hard, especially... Um, it, you know, they realize these are COVID kids, but also knowing that they had this hanging over their heads with this, this TCAP Absolutely. situation coming in. I know it's been very stressful for the staff as well. Uh, and parents mm -hmm. and students are all feeling the strain. I'm sure you're feeling it in this office. Um, so now we have these children who have, have maybe not their, head, their best testing date. And they have a problem. They can't go to <coughs> fourth grade. Unless they meet, uh, they, unless there's some intervention on their behalf. So tell me what you all are able to do for those students and what kind of progress you've made on that. So when, when you currently watch any media report, they refer to 
roughly 62% of kids as having failed TCAP and automatic candidates for retention. That is the incorrect way to really view that right now because what the state did was provide us multiple pathways for students to be promoted to the next grade level. If you read our news release, if you look at what we've sent out over the last four months, we communicated to parents that the TCAP score is not the only score. iReady is a state-approved screener, and what they've done for us is they have said that any child scoring at or above the 40th percentile and approaching on TCAP, approaching isn't proficient, but those two scores together allow a parent to fill out an appeals process, automatically guaranteed by the state if they meet that above the 40th and approaching, and that puts those students on to fourth grade. So that's an additional in our district, roughly 20% of our students are eligible for that parent waiver because the state recognizes a, a student reading at the 40th percentile is a student who is reading on grade level. You also have exemptions for students who are special education with a reading deficit, students with a 504 word reading services, students who have been retained, English language learners who have been in the country for less than two years, and English language learners who currently don't have command of the English language as measured by the WIDA assessment. All of those options allow us to promote those students and continue to support them with the interventions that have already been in place for those students once they receive the designation of SPED Tier 3 Suspected Reading Disability. So let me, let me clarify. All of those categories that you just mentioned, um, the special education designations, 504, English as a Second Language, all of those different caveats are included in those students that are showing as uh, the the 60 some percent that are below proficient those are all contributing to those numbers correct students with reading disabilities will typically not score proficient on a TCAP assessment right so so when you're reading when someone is reading these TCAP numbers you have to take into account that all of those exceptional categories are a part of that number correct it's that you're not talking about your average all of those aren't your average student that's sitting down to take the tests. Um, and I think that's an important thing when you pull out those numbers, what you have left is a, probably a much lower number uh, accordingly. So, okay, so if they, that's one caveat that they have, what are your other avenues to get them to fourth grade? So again, the parent appeals process being one for roughly 20% of our students, the exceptions and exemptions, which we just discussed, being roughly 20% of our students, then we get to the point to where we have students who actually did score below proficient on the test. And there are two more categories that exist for those students. There is the option of attending summer school for a student that scored approaching. They can come to summer school or have all core tutoring in their fourth grade year. For a very small number of our students in Jefferson County who scored below on the test, they will need to attend summer school and then also be provided tutoring in the next grade level. But if you look at the, the chart, like I said, that will accompany with this article, you'll see that that number of students who need that additional intervention or those two interventions is very small compared to the number of students we are automatically promoting. And I think it's also important to remember as you think through this process, we had a large number of third graders who were second graders last year who attended summer school without being made to attend summer school. Summer school is not a punishment. Summer school is not a remediation type of event. Summer school is something we do to encourage kids to continue building their literacy skills, and they've been doing it now for two years past COVID. We've tutored over, I think it's roughly 1,500 kids over the last two years during the school year with Tennessee Alcor. Again, tutoring is not a punishment. Tutoring is meant to help accelerate those kids and build their literacy skills. And I do think that, and, and you discussed this in the school board meeting, that it feels punitive to to parents and to students um, because they can't understand why am I failing I'm passing grade wise I'm doing what you're asking me to do why am I failing just because I didn't do good on this test so what are we doing to try to try to mitigate that for those students how are we trying to ease that I process? think as far as easing the process um, there again the in my opinion the word retention is the punitive damage is the uh, negativity assigned to this. Whenever we look at providing tutoring for students, providing summer school for, tu for students, um, that's all positive. That's a great thing. I myself, in my role, 
I have tutoring in decisions I make. I bring people together to help me make that decision. So there again, we're offering the same thing for students who are struggling. Um, we're bringing people together to help them improve. So those are great things. In my opinion, the state legislation got this wrong whenever they um, designated retention as the final consequence or as an in type of intervention. In my opinion, retention is not an intervention. Um, it's something that we do for a small number of students through conversations with parents, teachers, administration, guidance counselors, not just over a number or a refusal to do something. So I have a, I have a question uh, <coughs> regarding next year. So are these same third graders as they move into fourth grade, whether with tutoring or without tutoring, whatever caveats go with them into fourth grade, are they being, are they going to be held to uh, some sort of a benchmark in order to promote to fifth grade? Is this something that's going to follow this class of kids? And is this ongoing? Is every third grade class going, I guess every third grade class will be facing this uh, because Tennessee code, but what about fourth graders? So students who go on to um, promote on to fourth grade do have requirements that they have to um, have tutoring or they could face a retention at the end of fourth grade. And um, also next year, second graders who are rising third graders will have this same um, law that is um, affecting third graders this year. One thing about it is that our teachers and our administrators have had great conversations with students and with parents that have led to this growth and increased success. So there's a lot of great things that have come out of this, um, conversations with parents, growth of students, goal setting um, by our students. I just think that um, if we take the retention part out of this bill, then we have great things. Retention should be left at the local school uh, level and not at a state level. And so I have a, uh, another question and then let you guys fill in with, with whatever you think everyone needs to know beyond this. Um, those students, and, and I know it's a small amount, the percentage of students that don't already, you've not already found a pathway for them. Um, what happens if you're one of those students, your, your child is one of those students who cannot attend summer school for whatever reason they cannot <coughs> attend summer school. Maybe it's a custody issue or it could be a health issue, whatever it is, there's a reason they can't attend. Um, what do you do in that situation? And what are we looking at? How many, how many are we left with that we're still trying to find a pathway? Um, I, I would go back and say the biggest thing I think that we want everyone to understand is we started communicating this process I mean, at the beginning of the year before they left second grade so we've been trying to help parents understand exactly what this looks like and I think the thing that you know, makes us all proud is that we're talking about right now in the district according to the numbers we ran yesterday we have less than 10 students across the district who have a pathway but some circumstance prevents them from accessing that pathway to promotion whether that be something like a custody issue, a surgery scheduled over the summer, there is an appeals process that exists for those students where they could appeal that catastrophic event that prevents them from receiving the intervention they need. But I would also go back and say, these are students who scored below on the TCAP test. So again, you're talking about in the beginning, a very small number of students, and then an even smaller number of those who can't access that pathway. If you have a student that's in that position, then you need to reach out to your school's principal, to district staff, and let us know so that we're able to then address that issue now because addressing it at the end of summer is going to be much more difficult than working on a solution for that pathway right now. One thing I just want to add to that and for our parents, community, is reach out um, you know don't try to burden this on your own don't think there's not options or help out there um, 
all of us here at Central Office, all principals, uh, we want to see your child be successful. So reach out to us, call, email, and we will help you any way that we can to get through this and to do what's in the best interest of your child and your family. Thank you guys very much. Uh, you gentlemen have, have informed uh, beyond what I think the, the general public knew about this. Hopefully, uh, this will be repealed and it won't be a problem ongoing. But, you know, um, I know that you all are working on it for next year already and, and you have a, a lot of irons in the fire. And you've done well for our children trying to get them where they need to be. I'm, I'm sure parents are appreciative of that. Um, what contact information do they need to use if they do need to reach out, if someone needs to reach out to you? Uh, should they go to school level first? Is that um, the first? School level is the is great. Um, principal. Mm -hmm. Principal. Um, district level. Supervisors. You know, they can always... I get emails and then I forward them to... Uh, Christy, you know, if it goes really deep, like they're wanting numbers and, mm -hmm. and, and things, I send it to Christy and she helps them to, to find a direction. And if it's possible that, that the child might be, uh, which some parents don't even know what a 504 is, um, mm -hmm. so they might be eligible for that because that's not a, a normal special education designation. Right. Lots of people fall into a 504 that would not be in special education, the regular, sure. regular education students, but that would count in this instance. Yes. Uh, so I, I think we have to be really careful when we start generalizing that statement. Uh. The, the law requires us to look at students who have a 504 or an IEP that impacts their ability to read. Okay. There are lots of designations for IEPs and 504, mm -hmm. but it's that impacts the child's reading ability that we've had to be really careful to adhere to. Okay. And, um, and so that's good information to have. And uh, I appreciate it. If there's Thank anything you. else that you all need uh, to get out to the parents or any kind of dates or deadlines that they have to meet or anything that you need, mm -hmm. uh, please feel free now. Or uh, if not, then I will thank you for your time. Thank you. Appreciate it. Parent waiver. Um, if you received a letter that mentions the parent waiver or parents appeal process, that opens on May 30th. And we've asked that by June 10th, please complete that parent waiver, and we will begin contacting on June 10th any parent that hasn't taken advantage of that avenue. So again, that's a large number of students in the district who can take that and be automatically promoted to fourth grade, but the window for that is very small. So keep that on your calendars and be sure that if you need help with the paperwork, I'm sure there's somebody Absolutely. who can help you with the paperwork. Thank you all very much. Um, it's It's been a rough couple of weeks for you, I know, and, and especially this week has been rough as test scores have rolled out. But it's been rough for everybody across the state. So you all are in good company. Um, thank you, and I hope you all have a productive summer. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.